Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Goldstein. I'm the president of MAS and I'm delighted to kick off things this evening for our program. Thank you all for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat where the MAS team has um, put in some tips and hints and details for making uh, your experience smoother. I would also like to highlight that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There you can share any questions you have and our speakers will respond to as many as time allows later in the program. We are pleased to present this third MAS installment of Person Place Thing, which is a radio program where guests share their thoughts about one person, one place, and one thing with particular meaning to them. Past guests have included uh, Jennifer Egan discussing the Brooklyn Navy Yard and fashion designer Yoli Tang sharing her perspective on the Garment District. We are glad to continue hosting these conversations that celebrate our city and the people, places, and things that inspire us. It is our enormous pleasure and honor to introduce our speakers for this evening. Randy Cohen, our Person, Place, Thing host, began his career writing humor pieces and essays and stories for newspapers and magazines, including The New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, and Young Love Comics. Uh, his tele first television work was written for Late Night with David Letterman, for which he won three Emmy Awards. His fourth Emmy Award was for his work on Michael Moore's TV Nation. For 12 years, he wrote The Ethicist, a weekly column for the New York Times Magazine, and his most recent book, Be Good, How to Navigate the Ethics of Everything, was published by Chronicle. And following Randy is our guest tonight, uh, as our guest tonight is Sarah Carroll of the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission, where he, she serves both as the uh, chair and a commissioner. LPC is the largest municipal preservation agency in the United States. Sarah has a bachelor's degree in art history from Bates College and a master's of fine arts degree in historic preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Ms. Carroll was appointed by uh, Mayor de Blasio in October 2018 and manages a staff of approximately 80 architects, archeologists, preservationists, historians, um, attorneys, and administrators, all of whom its mission is to protect more than 36,000 architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites in all five boroughs, and to identify and designate new landmarks and districts. She is a lifelong preservationist and a native New Yorker. She has been at LPC since she started her career there 25 years ago. Sarah's tenure at LPC has been notable for many things, including the successful designation of more than 4,000 buildings and sites. But just as importantly, she's implemented numerous transparency and efficiency measures, including the development of a new internal permit tracking system database that increased efficiency and staff accountability in the application process. And I can speak from my own personal experience that she has brought a level of accessibility to LPC that has been an extraordinary breath of fresh air. It is our enormous pleasure to welcome both of you to this evening's program. And Randy, I now leave things in your very capable hands. Good evening. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So who is your person? So my person is my mother. And I, you know, I thought a lot about this. And at the end of the day, you know, my mother is just an incredibly special person who is so talented, creative, intellectual, independent, incredibly competent, has an, you know, incredible work ethic. And all of these things wrapped together, I think really sort of formed me and, um, and I can't think of anyone who really influenced me more. And so um, my person is my mom. Um, say her name. Her name is Carolee Carroll. And she uh, raised us single-handedly in New York City. Um, she had a career as a set designer, scenic artist, and art director. And we lived 
um, in a brownstone on the Upper West Side on the top floor in a brownstone owned by her best friends from theater school, Emily and David Mitchell. And David Mitchell was also a set designer. And, um, you know, our lives were really full and rich. Um, we grew up hanging around the backstage of theaters and television sets. And she, you know, with her work ethic, she worked many, many long hours. And as a result, my sister and I learned to be quite independent ourselves. And so, um, I, I, you know, we had this just wonderfully rich childhood. And I think that it influenced many of the decisions I've made in my life. Can we say a little about um, some of the sets she worked on? Um, who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? The Broadway yeah. run in 1962, right? In the 70s. It was the second one. The second the run. And um, yeah, she worked. Um, she was assisting several different designers during that period. She was working with Bill Rittman, um, Neil Champolis, and David Mitchell. And um, that show she worked on with Bill Rittman and... Um, was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I remember that vividly as sort of being, you know, part of our lives. Uh, Death Trap was another one Death that Trap. I remember being, <laughs> you know, constant in, in during those periods. Uh, and, you know, our she was drafting all the time and her drafting table was really the focal point of our living room. <laughs> and I think, you know, I sort of absorbed um, a sensibility about, you know, drafting the mechanics of drawing, but also sort of the aesthetics of design. Oh. I have to say also on the side, she has designed a couple of houses, she painted, she drew, so she did fine arts. And, um, you know, I, I think she's sort of an incredibly well-rounded artist. When you were hanging around um, backstage at Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, were you a little young for this? Yes, I don't know that I was backstage for that one. I do remember, um, you know, David Mitchell, who we lived with, designed Annie, and I we used to yes. hang out behind the backstage at Annie all the time and followed Andrea McCardle around like super fans. <laughs> I'm still a super fan. Yes, it was. I don't know if she remembers us, but we were there all the time trailing behind her. Um, but I remember my mother worked on something with Margaret Hamilton. And Margaret we were, Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz? The Wicked Hamilton? Witch of the West, yes. And uh, we were, of course, as kids, big fans of The Wizard of Oz. And we had the record and we used to play it all the time. And The Wicked Witch of the West so terrified me that even listening to the record, I would have to pick up the needle and skip her parts. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember no, a big, big moment in my life when I could listen to the whole record without skipping her part. Oh, you've come a long way and we're all very proud of you. I know. But um, there's no higher praise to an actor than that they've terrified you as a child. Yes, but I think poor, the poor Margaret Hamilton, I think had to, to you know, deal with children who were scared of her for the rest of her career. <laughs> And my mother introduced us and, and she was so lovely and so wonderful. And she gave us pictures with handwritten notes on, you know, a picture of her melting saying, Sarah, Alice, help me, I'm melting. <laughs> and she couldn't have been nicer. And my sister and I just stood there frozen. And my mother was mortified because we couldn't say a word to her. But I think that was probably something she experienced with all children <laughs> later in her career. <laughs> When you were a kid, and, and this was just you're you're hanging around backstage at Annie. Did did you realize this was a really big deal, or did you was this just your ordinary life? It was um, an ordinary life. It was our ordinary life, but I do think that I always understood that it was special too, I, or I appreciated it anyway. Let's say I think I really did. Um, appreciate this window into this magical world that, um, you know, for people in the audience was magic. So mm -hmm. I, I think I did really appreciate it, although it was normal for us yeah. as our day-to-day -day life. Um, one of the things I learned about your mother preparing for this that I admired about her is um, the work she did at the, what is the Algonquit Playhouse in Maine, yes. that I, I admired that she just 
got on with it throughout this long professional life. And then it, it kind of didn't matter whether it was a Broadway show or this playhouse in Maine. That just seems so admirable to me. Yeah, well, we had a long history with the Agunquit Playhouse. My grandparents actually went to Agunquit, moved to uh, Maine and in 1938 because my grandfather started to work at the Agunquit Playhouse doing sets. And uh, grandfather my grandfather, my mother's father. So you're and, in this whole set designer family. Yes. Well, and my aunt became an actress. So yeah. my father <laughs> my, was in the paper business in Reading, well, Pennsylvania. I'm there you go. sick with jealousy. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, she grew up around the playhouse and they had a, a, a student theater called the Colony Theater. She studied there as well as working at the playhouse. And then, yes, as an adult, she also designed there. And, you know, it was an important summer circuit theater at the time, and, and it still operates today. And then actually, you know, as we were getting older, she, um, in, in it sort of supporting her first love of the theater, she worked in television and she worked as a scenic mm -hmm. artist on, you know, the original Saturday Night Live, the late show with David Letterman, <laughs> probably at the same time as you. And, um, and eventually the last 20 years of her career, she was the art director of the Today Show. So um, we, we were around those television sets a lot as well. Do you think all this, um, this presence of set design in your life in any way led you to think of the built environment as the set designs of our lives? Absolutely. Or is that I, cheesy? It's a little, you know, <laughs> it is, but it's, I think it's pretty honest. I think it's, it is, um, it is and it isn't. It's, it's an interesting thing. I think that the, you know, the drafting and the mechanics of architectural drawings, I sort of absorbed all of that. And I think that I experienced the built environment through a very aesthetic kind of visual lens that I sort of inherited from this experience. But it is very interesting because Set design is, is impermanent, right? Yes. It's, it's something that is made for a particular moment to create sort of a magic. It then is folded up and packed up and moved along, put into another theater. So it's, and put up again the next day. So it's a very kind of impermanent thing that's about deceiving and, and magic. And, and that's quite different than thinking about the permanence of, the built environment and preservation and what we do in preservation. But I do think there's an interesting kind of nexus there. Well, uh, yes. And you could, if you wanted to get to probably too psychological about it, you, you could see your work as in a way the opposite of her work because yeah. she dealt in the ephemeral and, and you deal in the, in the permanent. Yeah. Um, is, is I, boy, I haven't seen you in a clinical setting, but um, this like <laughs> repudiates your mother's whole approach to design. <laughs> it, well, it grew from it. And, you know, she also is um, sort of a preservationist at heart too. And, and she's, you know, she's a good historian. She does research and she, in her retired life, um, after she retired, she moved back to Maine and she's served as the curator of the Agunquit Heritage Museum. So it all sort of wraps up together. Oh, so in some ways you've gone into the family business. Yes, <laughs> in some ways, yeah. I mean, it was a theater business and she had an interest in preservation. I went into preservation and always had an interest in theater and somehow we've kind of made a complete circle with each other. And she approves of your work, I guess. She does, she does. And I will still call her and say, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Um, have you ever disagreed about um, the merits of a building? No, I, I mean, we've certainly disagreed about certain things, but I would say uh, not on the merits of a building, I think that. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So is there a family aesthetic? There may be, there may very well be. I think, wow. yeah. Well, that is sort of appreciation of design and, and I'm not sure that it has to be any particular period. I think we both um, appreciate design from any period, good design. I think, um, I think it's a visual sensibility. 
Um, you must have learned decades before someone like me that there were actual designers who were responsible for the way the built environment looks because of your mom. And that it was quite late in life before it, I think it dawns on many children or, you know, or me that there's, there are people that, that building didn't just grow there. There are people who made a whole series of choices That's right. to account for why it looks that way. Do you remember learning that? Or is that just always a part of your life? I think so. Well, you know, I remember, and this may be sort of, a seed of that growing when I was in about junior high school and I had an art assignment to go draw my bedroom. And I thought, I don't know how to draw a bedroom. And I asked my mother, how do I draw a bedroom? And she said, you figure it out. <laughs> so really? I thought after a moment of panic, I looked over at the drawing table, her drafting table at a, you know whatever elevation of uh, whatever show she was working on and I thought oh it's so easy it's a five-sided box and that's how I drew my bedroom was as if it, I was looking at one of her drawings of a stage set that had you know walls and a back wall side walls and a floor and a ceiling and just no front wall and I sort of learned perspective that way. And I think that those exercises help you to understand even at a young age that people create these things. You know, that this is, this is coming from inside a yeah. designer, whether it be an architect or a set designer or a costume designer, or, you know, or, or jewelry designer. And you, it comes from somewhere in here, it flows through to a drawing, which is then executed. Do you still draw? I don't draw as much as I would like to. I did, um, you know, she, my mother really encouraged me to draw a lot when I was younger and, and through college and, you know, even, um, in later years, I, I still continue to do drawing lessons, but it's something that at this point, just so many balls in the air, I just don't have time to do it, you know, regrettably. Do, do other people uh, among your colleagues, do they draw? I think that, it, yes. I can think of some commissioners who, when we are in a live public hearing, sitting at the table drawing, and you know, are they drawing like pictures of people criticizing them? No, they're they drawing with like devil horns on them, and sometimes they're redesigning projects that we're looking at, <laughs> <laughs> or they're just drawing, you know, architectural ideas and doodles. But they're, you know, sort of uh, designing in a way while they're passing the time. <laughs> and so, but, yes, I would say, call, I th I think there's something natural. Many people, I think, who are interested in preservation come at it from a kind of a visual place. And those are people who also, I think, often like to draw, and particularly architects who do draw. Yes, although I think maybe your mom represents the kind of apotheosis of a generation of designers who drew as opposed to working yes. digitally. And, and Correct. it's the world, it's just very different now. It's a different way of thinking too, I believe, not just a different way of working. It's do, a different way agree? of thinking. I absolutely agree. It's, it is a very, I think it's a very different way to, for that, that process to go from brain to hand to paper than it is on a computer. It's just a different medium and I think a different, in some ways, thought process. Um, let's, let's move on and talk a little about your place. Okay. What is your place? No, I'm sorry. The official way to do this is where is your place? <laughs> My place is, um, it's the ocean, but specifically in, you know, the ocean in Maine. And as I said, we have, you know, our, our family connections in Maine. I spent, uh, you know, every summer uh, at, when I was growing up with my grandparents in Maine and we continue to have this connection up there. And, um, but I, you know, the ocean anywhere. And I think um, part of the reason the ocean in Maine, I think really, you know, sort of resonates for me is I think that the ocean sort of taps into all of our senses, right? Our sound, our, our, what we're looking at, 
how we feel it, how we experience it. And in, you know, in Maine, there's something sort of magical about the way the light hits the water. And the light is, it's, you're just so far east that the light is sort of on the water, the water sparkles, and then there's this incredible contrast with the land, the rocks and the green trees and the, and the rich brown colors of the rocks. And I think that's why so many artists went there in the early 20th century. The light is incredible. And, it, and it's, you know, so many people have painted there for that reason. Um, but, you know, the ocean, it's also so powerful and fluid, you know, sort of uncontrollable. While where one can sort of control or manage the built environment, one cannot control the ocean. It is something you have tremendous respect for. I, you know, I can swim in it and feel enveloped and wrapped in it and feel at home, but there's always that sense that it is stronger and greater. So it's, it's interesting, but it's a very powerful place for me to be. And I always used to say growing up, I'd get my energy in New York City and I'd get my strength from the ocean in Maine. Ah. It is in, in many ways like the opposite of your work. The ocean is constantly changing and there's no way you can freeze it in, 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 at any moment. And yes. yet you spend your working life trying to uh, freeze things at some moment. Yeah, exactly. Is it, is it a, a counterbalance, not just in terms of um, psychological, but is it a counterbalance in the way you think about the world? The ocean I, is natural, you work in the built environment, the ocean is changing, your environment you're trying to keep from changing. Absolutely. I think that that is uh, a counterbalance. I think that I am most, you know, I'm an earthy person and I, you know, that's I think part of why I am so involved with the built environment, but that, um, that sort of ever-changing uncontrollable nature is, um, you know, I think sort of stronger and transcends all of it. And I, you know, so anyway, I think I'm a balanced person because of this sort of counterbalance and having both of these aspects of my life sort of working together, both of these places working together. Ah. Um, is your good friend, the ocean, um, turning into the enemy of your work in, in the sense yeah. of rising sea levels, global warming. Have you, have you had to take that into account in your working life? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a big topic that we focus on a lot and have for, you know, many, many, many years now. And, um, you know, there are, um, well, you know, in New York City, the really the areas that are most vulnerable that are already landmarked are, you know, the southern part of Manhattan, both kind of on the east and the west side, and then certainly, you know, Coney Island and, um, but, you know, other areas, um, you know, don't have as many landmarks, Oh, but, you know, um, downtown Brooklyn and, and Dumbo and those areas, Brooklyn Heights, those areas also are are vulnerable. So when we um, when we're working with our landmarks, we are constantly thinking about resiliency measures. We recently um, adopted new rules that would make it more clear and easy for people who want to make changes to deal with rising water and um, allow more flexibility to deal with it. So we um, and we so we we sort of approach it from our regulatory in our regulatory work. Um, but we also have started to think about it in our designation work as well. And so the Coney Island boardwalk was really the first new landmark where we had to confront rising waters and what that might mean. And we addressed it in our designation report um, up front and thought about what would it mean if the boardwalk is bought is washed out. What does that mean in terms of how we approach it and think about it? So that was really the first landmark where we really had to kind of deal with um, the issue of climate change and rising water and resiliency up front. And of course, in our regulatory work, we're addressing it all the time. Do you th uh, does it change your approach to designating a building knowing that it's threatened by rising water? 
are you more apt to designate it because you you have to protect it now there's a certain urgency to it um i think you know we haven't fortunately really been put in that position yet i think that so many of the areas that are most vulnerable are already landmarked with that are sort of densely built urban environments um, you know, so there are areas in the Rockaways, for example, that um, one could think about, but we haven't had a lot of advoca advocacy for those areas and those neighborhoods. So it isn't, you know, and we are aware of some areas of interest and mindful about what it might mean uh, if they, if the homeowners are dealing with rising waters and the impact on them. But um, but luckily, you know, we haven't had to really sort of make a decision about whether to designate something or not because of that potential threat. You haven't gone the other way and thought, say, in lower Manhattan um, and looked at a building and said, well, you know, it's gorgeous and historic, but it's going to be underwater in 10 years. So the hell with it. Well, so many of them are already landmarked. Uh, but the ocean ignores your, you know, yes. no matter what you say, yeah. the, you know, the ocean ignores it. Yes. So, for example, in the South Street Seaport during um, Superstorm Sandy, you know, I think we really witnessed the kinds of challenges that our historic buildings are going to face. And, um, you know, all the base of all those buildings were flooded. And so right after that, everybody was putting the mechanical equipment on the top of the building. And, you know, we had to accommodate that, even though traditionally the commission would prefer not to see highly visible mechanical equipment. Uh, um, you know, uh, you can't have it in the basement and have these buildings continue to be viable, right? So uh, for the preservation of the building, get that mechanical equipment up on the roof, allow them to have sort of more sacrificial materials at the base that, um, uh, that won't completely shut down the building if there's another storm. I remember reading that there are kids in New York, especially in, in poor neighborhoods, who've never been to the ocean and found this just astonishing and shocking and, and sad, too. Yeah. That, that, but, but there's some truth to the idea that, well, we're a seaside town. You know, there are seagulls. We see seagulls every day. Um, but we don't feel like, at least in Manhattan, we don't feel like we're on the ocean. Do, or, or do you? No, it's true. And I think about this a lot because, you know, as a, a native New Yorker, my experience with the ocean was going to Maine. It wasn't in New York. And here we are so close. We were surrounded by water. And, um, and you know, as a Queens resident now, I suppose I, you know, I think I feel a, a little bit more connected to it in that there are the Rockaways. And there is sort of more of a... Um, why are you chuckling at the Rockaways? What's wrong with well, no, the no, Nothing's wrong with it. It's just that it's a connection to the waterfront that you don't experience in Manhattan, I think. So, um, so I do feel it a little bit more, but I think about how odd it is that you really don't feel like you're in a seaside place when you're in New York City. I, I suppose it's, you know, because it's so urban as well. And we think of the ocean as more, you know, sort of natural. I don't know. I think of like bustling um, port cities. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know Marseille. Um, um, right. You you know the whole Mediterranean coast where these are. But but maybe it's because um, the even the 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 waterfront on the Hudson and on the East River, um, it's not so much a, a working waterfront now. I wonder if right. that's changed the way we see our relationship to the ocean. Yeah. Well, I think it's improved actually on the you know on the East River and the Hudson. I think that there's actually is now much more access to the water than there were when I was growing up when when it was really more industrial oh, yeah. and working. Yeah. So I think you actually there there are many more green spaces along the water where you can get closer to it. Um, and you're right, I think it is true. There are port cities and so there are cities on the water. There's Miami Beach with high rises on the water. Right. So uh, you know I, it, it's funny I don't know I, maybe because New York just has so many other things going on. There's just so much here for everybody yeah, to experience some of us are, that, yeah. You're spending all your time backstage at Annie instead of going <laughs> to the beach. Uh, but, but we did have um, 
and and as was was mentioned in the introduction, when Elizabeth mentioned um, when Jennifer Egan um, did an event with this, and she was really enthusiastic about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, mm -hmm. and, and that's a nautical place. It's a wonderful place. It's it, it's a wonderful place, and it's so exciting to see it actually, you know, working now, and and so much activity going on there. Was that something um, you guys were involved with, or did that grow up more as a commercial enterprise, um, independently of you? It, it was independent of us. There are a few landmarks within the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, but it also, it, there was, uh, you know, it's sort of, I think much of it was under state and federal authority, and they can override the city regulations. So that's another reason that we were sort of on the periphery of it. Um, but we certainly have um, been able to engage and visit it. And I think it's wonderful what's happening there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really bustling. Um, bustling. Let's talk a little about your thing. What's your thing? So my thing is terracotta. And I think... You know, again, I had to think a long time about what should my thing be? And I think I told you this, I was sitting in the dentist's office looking out the window <laughs> at buildings along Broadway in NoHo and realized that one of the things that has always, um, I think for me, you know, that's tied me to the built environment here in the city is the kind of rich, robust ornament on our buildings. And that's all terracotta. I mean, we have terracotta everywhere in this city, architectural terracotta. And, you know, it's structural, it's non-structural, it's, it's ornament, it's, um, sorry, let me get my, it's, you know, it, it's, you can have a building like the all-in court, which is every inch of the building is just incredible carving. Or, you know, you have other buildings that are just good working buildings in Soho or around the Flatiron area that are big store and loft buildings that are robust and strong with brick and, and terracotta ornament. And, you know, the Woolworth building. I mean, it, it, it's just everywhere. The, the Guastavino tile ceiling. So, it's, I think, just such an incredible part of, of our built environment in the city. And I think you can't um, experience the city without recognizing that this material just sort of is, you know, again, the, it's the sort of the sculptural piece to it, the sort of visually appealing piece to it that gives our city that kind of special quality. Um, let's, can we start with something really basic and explain to the people who are less sophisticated than yeah. you and me, and, you know, <laughs> probably our entire audience, but what is terracotta? Terracotta is, it's a, um, it's a clay, fired clay ma uh, material. And it, um, so it's, it's natural materials, but man-made and it can be cast in any, um, uh, in different, you know, different forms, which may, you know, if you were to do a stone building and carve every single part of it, that would sort of be unmanageable. This is lighter and you can do molds and you can have certain prototypes for certain moldings that you're gonna see. And you can see them around the city. You can see where they've been used, um, different castings. And, um, and then you can apply ornament that looks like carved stone and it, yet it's cast clay. And, um, and again, it can, it's, it can be used structurally or non-structurally, um, but, but I think we experience it mostly as ornament on facades of buildings. So it can be formed into bricks. Um, yes. It can be used as cladding on a steel frame building, um, but your affection is for its flexibility in ornamenting buildings. Yes. Yes. Um, can, we, can you give me some examples of particular favorites of yours? Yeah, well, I, I just mentioned Alwyn Court, which I think, you know, yes. as a young person going and standing in front of it, you can stand for hours and just study every inch of it. Um, the, you know, the, the Woolworth building is another favorite of mine. And um, 
Can we say, I, I have a gripe about the Woolworths building, which I personally, yeah, I do. Yeah, um, and I think it's one of, or may, you could make a case that it's the most beautiful building in New York. I mean, it's certainly in my top town. It's just yeah. thrilling. And when I first, I moved to New York in um, 1973. And when, when I was by the Woolworths building, I pop into the lobby and the lobby is just amazing. Yeah. There's so much detail. There's so much, and it's nutty. You know, it's Woolworth counting his coins. It's <laughs> fantastic, know. but uh, you can't just pop into the lobby yeah. anymore. Um, and yeah. I, I, I don't think that's part of your province. But doesn't that break your, It breaks my heart. I just think that's wrong. It's yes. It you know, it's sort of one of those unfortunate things that comes with modern times. I guess in the need feel the need there's a feeling that you need security. But um, I think but that's I, bogus. I just don't think in, in, yeah. in Kabul, they're thinking, oh, the Woolworths building, we will destroy that beautiful ornamentation and, and ruin New York yeah. psychologically. I think, that's, I think it's security theater. I think it's lawyers at work. I don't think it has to do it with protecting be. me. And but it I, robs me of this beauty. Yeah. I, you know, I will say for the Woolworth building, I know that if you reach out to them, they will take take you through it they love but to that's not the same it, but it's um, not yes the they're, same. they're they're regular tours you could you with no trouble you can arrange to be part of a tour and see this wonderful yeah. thing but what was one of the things that i love about new york is when these structures are just part of our our day-to-day -day life you yeah. don't have to arrange a tour it's not a special event you that's go right. oh i'll spend five minutes in the woolworths building lobby and and that's diminished yeah it's true. It's not the same as walking through it and just experiencing it as part of our day-to-day -day life, part of our norm. It, 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 when you have to make an appointment to see it, yes. it's a different yes. thing. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. And I think, you know, we have uh, designated many lobbies of buildings at, that, um, you know, are publicly accessible, but they have now been you know, there are now security gates and turnstiles and sort of yeah. an unfortunate sign of the times. But I, you know, back to my mom, I can remember when she worked at, uh, Rock, at Rockefeller Center at the, uh, in the RCA building in her office. And I'd go through that lobby every day to meet her so at the great. studio or an office. It's so great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I worked in that building for seven years when yes. I worked at late night. And to enter that building and you felt so lucky. Just, yeah. You'd see those, I'd sometimes go, I, I, I would, our offices were on the Sixth Avenue side, but I'd walk around to the Fifth Avenue side just to enter and go past that. It's yeah. just, you just felt, that's my life. I get to be in this every day and it's great. Exactly. Uh, my other gripe about this where things are, are no longer part of our ordinary daily life is um, the, the Central Park Zoo, mm -hmm. which is, I just think they did a beautiful job designing it, you know, from the old zoo that was like animal jail. It's really wonderful. But before people would just go eat their lunch there. Um, they'd yeah. sit by the sea lion pool. Now, what is it? $13. I, I don't want to brag, but I have $13 in my pocket right now and I could go, but it makes it an event. And it makes it an event and there's a line. You know, so you can't just, but, but it, you might not make it to have your lunch and get back out. It changes the relationship of that public space to that's the city. It. And I think that's sad, but I, I guess that's not something you can, can you call them? We really can't. I wish we could. It's another, it's a favorite place of mine as well. But, uh, you know, we, we don't, uh, we don't get involved in, in use. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging. I should remind uh, the listeners that if they have questions um, and complaints like mine, that even though they're completely <laughs> not a part of your job, uh, we will take questions at the end, just type them in the Q&A box. Um, oh, as long as we've digressed a little bit, do, uh, am I right that you folks just protected 75th Avenue? We, we did, we just voted on it yesterday. Yesterday, um, so it is and, an unofficial and, New York City landmark. And am I right that that the emphasis there was less on um, architectural uniqueness than on its historical significance? Well, it's it's yes, we really focused on the historical significance. It is a very fine uh, building. It's a very very good piece of architecture, and its architecture really conveys the the uses that were there and the significance. So, 
Um, I think oh, say really, a little about so I what think, those you know, uses were. We were talking, actually, one of our commissioners commented at the vote about walking by and seeing the, the cartouches that represented the progressive uh, organizations that were in the building. And so I think, there we go, speaking of terracotta again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are they, is it terracotta? I will have to double check, but I'm, I suspect Ooh, I it hope is. So. It would tie yes, everything I, together so elegantly. Tie... But that was a, a longtime headquarters for the NAACP. NAACP and, and many others, a sort of a forerunner of the ACLU and, um, and, and many other, you know, sort of the area was sort of a hotbed for progressive organizations at the time. And so, um, yes, it's designated really, and we focused on the historic significance, but it is, it's architecture, it's architecturally significant as well. And I think, you know, that's something the commission has always done is we've always um, designated properties for either architectural, historic, or cultural significance, but more often than not, it's multi-layered and multifaceted. Oh. So it's not as if your, 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 um, have two separate categories, uh, right. buildings that are historically significant or culturally significant and buildings that are architecturally important. It's some blend of both? It can be. It, sometimes it's separate, sometimes. I, so for example, thinking about the Louis Armstrong house. Oh, right? I've that, been there. That's fantastic. That's right. an amazing place. It's fantastic, but it is not a, it is not designated for its architecture. It's a relatively modest house that has been altered but he had lived there for 30 years and he made those alterations and that's what it looked like when he lived there. So that is really designated for its cultural significance, not its architectural significance. Um, when I go there, one of the things that was so striking is because of that, it's this ordinary house in this ordinary block. You walk down the street and you go, and this immortal genius lived yes. there. And it just yes. seems uncanny. Yes, he wasn't the only one though. There was. There were others. I know in that it's a big, area. it became a big jazz neighborhood, but yeah. uh, and for unfortunate reasons too, it was um, black artists had a hard time buying houses in other neighborhoods. That's but correct. But this neighborhood yeah. was more welcoming. Yeah, yeah. Am I right about that? That's that's correct. Um, and we also have designated um, a historic district in Queens called Addisley Park, which is also an area that became. Um, a neighborhood where many of the jazz musicians and others were able to find a home ownership and be able to, you know, achieve home ownership where they couldn't elsewhere. It's, um, there's a building I cycle by um, almost every weekend when we're heading up to the bridge and, and, and it's at 159th and Riverside. Um, and it was, uh, uh, um, historians ha ha have learned that it was uh, a stop on the Underground Railroad. Do you know this building I'm talking about? It couldn't be more nondescript. It's just this little two-story building and it used to have a, a lovely porch that's gone. I mean, it's, it's architecturally, it's nothing now, but historically it's thrilling to just to go by it and to the way it connects you to the past. Um, yeah. Well, I, I do know the building. It's like interesting that. because it, it's, um, it's quite old when you think about the development of the city moving north you know, that that is um, old for that section of the city, which was really being developed at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and there, you know, I think, um, and it is, it's very nondescript. It, the, it's been heavily altered as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that the connections to the underground are, are quite speculative at this point, And there ah. has not been any um, real, uh, you know, documented connection. So, there are some tenuous connections to the developer who never lived there. Um, so it's, it, you know, these things are, are tricky and we think about them all the time. So, but interesting, you know, we also recently designated another house in downtown Brooklyn at 227 Duffield Street. And, you know, many also thought that that was a stop on the Underground Railroad and also not confirmed. And, and you can understand why this, this clandestine activity this is very dangerous. So it wouldn't necessarily always be documented, but that house was the home of noted abolitionists and we could document their activity while they were living in that house. So. Oh. Right. So, you, so being a historian is very much part of your job, or at least yes. having access yes. to really good historians. Is yes, important. and having a, a very strong research department. <laughs> oh, 
doing I'm, I'm so jealous. You have the greatest job in New York. It's, it just seems because it connects you to the present and the past, and it yes. and it and it connects the past to the present. Yes. And that just seems what a great thing to do. It's really wonderful, and I think you know I just you know it. When I went to graduate school, I just wanted to get back to New York. There was, you know, New York was my home and I really wanted to be working in the city that I loved and, and that, you know, really held a special place in my heart. And I, you know, uh, this job has been wonderful because I've been able to, you know, continue to learn. I learn every day about new places. I have visited all parts of the city. I've climbed to the top of steeples. I've continued to go backstage in theaters that are now landmarked. And, you know, it's just a wonderful experience. I, I, I have a whole list of buildings I'd like to talk to you about, but um, I think we should <laughs> open it up to some other people who will have their questions too. Um, okay. Um, what's your favorite non-New York City landmark, national or international? Oh, I, you know, I'm not good with favorites because I really like so many things, but let me see. Um, you know, Notre Dame Cathedral for like international, I think for me, I had, well, you know, Paris is just so wonderful anyway, but I think having, um, you know, personal moments there that were, um, you know, wonderful moments with friends surrounded by this incredible architecture and sort of, and, you know, with this is the beacon and the backdrop of these great memories. So, um, you know, again, the architecture kind of contributes to your entire experience and defines your experience. Um, let me see other landmarks that um, outside of New York City. Um, let me see, well, you know, there are, you know, so many other historic cities are, isn't, aren't there, and, you know. Yeah, but we do care about, about them, really. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I let us go down this terrible path. I mean, I love it here. Um, let me ask here, you too. something else about here or, or that someone else has asked us. How do you address historic green space in preservation um, th through the lens of environmentalism? I didn't know that you did designate green spaces, do you? We have designated scenic landmarks. Uh, uh, the criteria is that they be city owned parks or parkways and that they be significant for their sort of landscape design. And um, so, you know, Central Park, Riverside Park, Prospect Park are all scenic landmarks. And, but so are Ocean Parkway and Eastern Parkway, interestingly, also designed by Olmsted as, you know, Ocean Parkway connecting you from Prospect Park to the water and um, design, they're designed parkways. So they're also scenic landmarks and, you know, we, um, we, when we approach them, I think we, th we look at similar things that we look at for buildings, you know, sort of what's the integrity, how much of the original design intent is there, how much of the original, you know, hardscape is there. We don't really delve into plantings so much, um, or vegetation or species of plants, but, uh, certainly looking at the design intent, the hardscape, the, fixtures and features that are more permanent within the park. Ah, um, here, here's another question uh, from Livia uh, Yankowitz. Um, does cultural significance mean that, and I'm quoting here, that the ugly, to my mind, current needle buildings, so I, I assume she's speaking about um, um, along the south side of Central Park, um, uh, some of whose shadows negatively affect Central Park might be legitimately protected in the future. I'm sorry, read that again, just because I- Just I cultural stress. significance mean that the ugly, to my mind, um, needle buildings might be protected in the future. The cultural significance, uh, meaning that this is sort of there of this period in time, and is that, uh, I'm sort of 
having a hard time understanding how the cultural significance. Well, I guess uh, what I take this to mean is they might not have any cultural significance now, but suppose, you know, some brilliant novelist, uh, you know, moves into <laughs> one of those buildings, although how they afford it and if they had any civic <laughs> right. sense, why would they? And if they had any civic sense, why would they? But that's me. But, but um, I, can you imagine a, a building that now is, is deprecated as, as hideous um, might take on cultural significance and, and you'd be obliged to protect it? Yeah, sure. You can, right? There are always, as we move forward in time, our perspective changes. And, you know, that's one of the kind of fascinating things about preservation. And, you know, we talked a lot about it being a more sort of more about permanence, but, but preservation in itself is very fluid, right? And as we move forward in time, more and more things become historic and we have a different perspective. We can put it in a perspective that we can't necessarily have at a, in the moment. And so, yes, I would say, well, I would say, I, I would never say that anything couldn't at some point be considered um, significant for some either architectural, cultural, or historic reason, depending on what happens and how we view that event in the future, looking back. Um, we have, uh, here's another question I should say, after this, we'll have time for one or two more, if anyone would like to type them into the Q&A box. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, if you can think of an interesting but untraditional landmark that stands out in your mind. Yes, I think um, one that is very untraditional is the street plan of Colonial New York and New Amsterdam, which is, uh, we, we designated the, literally the, the configuration of the streets south of Wall Street. And so it is not about um, the buildings on the street. It's not even about the paving on the street. It's, it's the configuration of the streets from Wall Street um, sort of heading south. And I think that's a very unusual designation. We're not talking about built fabric. We're talking about a street grid that tells you about the early development of the city, the colonial development of the city. Wow, I love your job. Um, I, I think this will, will be our last question because we're running out of time. Um, can, can you say a little about uh, where terracotta ornaments were made for New York buildings in the past and are they still being created today? Yes, well, you know, here in New York City, we had the New York Architectural Terracotta Works, I believe it was called, and their building is, um, is also a landmark, although they no longer operate. And it's on um, the, the Queens waterfront on the East River, sort of in front of, if you know the Silver Cup Studios, it's sort of in front of that, closer to the water. And it's a small um, building, but it was the site where of the New York Architectural Terracotta Works. And so it was fabricated here and um, they, you know, have not been in business for a long time, but um, there's Boston Valley terracotta that continues to do um, make terracotta and is used for projects all over the city. So cool. And it seems like such a tie to the past. Um, I think we're out of time. Sarah, thank you so much for discussing all this. I, we should just make, let's just make this a weekly show. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is so much fun and it's such a, a wonderful time and way to have a conversation. So thank you. Oh, for... thank you. That's nice of you to say. Um, we should welcome back uh, Elizabeth Goldstein who has a, a, a few closing remarks. Well, I can't thank you enough, Randy and Sarah, for this lovely conversation. It was really fun to listen to and, and uh, um, and we enjoyed your, your banter as well as the amazing uh, information that you shared, Sarah, both about your person, place, thing, but also um, about the city that we all love. So thank you so much for, for doing this. We appreciate your, your time this evening. Uh, this episode uh, will actually um, air later on the Northeast uh, Public Radio. Uh, you can also listen to past episodes of the show by visiting personplacething.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, for logistics this evening, I really want to especially thank my colleagues at MAS, in particular, Yana Angelo and uh, Jackie Muallen for all of their work on pulling this event together. 
I hope that if you are not already a member of MAS, you will consider joining your membership dollars and donations help keep us providing program, programming just like this and supporting our continuing policy and advocacy work. We hope that you'll stay tuned for upcoming MAS programs and tours by visiting mas.org slash events. If you're free this Friday, uh, May 21st at 1 p.m., we'll be hosting a conversation with cities around the world on the topic of comprehensive planning. Thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you soon.